So my friends, that's okay. So thank you for coming and let's make some noise first. Let's generate good energy from early morning. Yay, Ukraine, you rule, woo! Yay, yay. Great, I always knew that Ukrainian people can make a lot of noise together with Israel people and other guys who are in this room, which is nice. So, my name is Edward, I came from Latvia, fantastic small country, and uh, before, we actually, before we start, I want to ask you a simple question. Who knows what is software craftsmanship? Who can define software craftsmanship? Who can define? Go ahead, give your definition. Aha. Uh -huh. Your opinion, what's that? Well, Craft the software, software, okay? Your opinion? Who was, who was there? Okay. For, so, okay, the, yes, that's nice, fantastic uh, definitions. I agree with all of them. For me, personally, software craftsmanship is about how to be professional in software develop in, in software development. So since we now know what software craftsmanship is, we can now go beyond software craftsmanship immediately and discuss more advanced stuff, right? So today I'm going to tell you something that I have learned the hard way. Something that no one taught me in school and something that I would benefit from a lot if I knew it a bit earlier. So here's my story about Johnny and his road towards a remarkable career. Meet Johnny. Johnny is a regular guy, let's say Java developer, technical guy with five years of software development experience. Let's say he works at a company called HR Days. And uh, he works full time, has decent salary and he prays software craftsmanship gods. Yeah? Uh, like all of us, Johnny also has a boss, Milton. Milton's the project manager at HR Days company. He's a senior guy. He reports directly to top management. He believes that software craftsmanship is bullshit and a waste of time. And obviously, he never ever wrote a line of code. And, and Johnny actually hates Milton a lot. He hates Milton because every year, Johnny goes to Milton and begs him for a salary rise. He says, uh, you know, Milton, please, I need this like a 500 euros because I do TDD and all this fancy stuff that these guys in my team are not doing. I'm the best guy in the team, the brilliant rock star, but these guys in my team sucks, right? I'm the best, I'm the brilliant, I'm gifted, I'm talented, I'm super, superman, right? And every year, Johnny hears the same answer over and over again. Well, John, yeah, you're doing a great job, really. You're doing a great job. Good boy. Good boy. But there is a small, tiny problem. We do not have a budget this year. Take a corporate insurance. Have you ever heard that? We do not have a budget. We do not have a budget. That's what we usually hear. So feeling extremely upset and undervalued, Johnny rides to his mentor, Lawrence, shit, Lawrence. So Lawrence is a retired Kotlin software architect. He has 10 years of Kotlin software development experience. He's a very senior guy. And Johnny cries to Lawrence, oh, Lawrence, I'm going to leave tomorrow because this company, they don't value my skills. They don't value my craft. They don't understand how good I am. There are so many companies on the market who can pay me way more. So I'm going to leave now. And Lauren says, Johnny, but what did you tell your boss, Milton, to get the salary r r rise? Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, well, 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 I actually told that I know TDD, BDD, DDD, and how to refactor Govna code on a daily basis. I know plenty of great frameworks like Spock, Spark, Machine Learning, and Unikernels. What? What are you talking about, man? So do you really, do you really use this fancy stuff to bring value to the customer? Because from a management perspective, all the fancy things that you know, 
and, then, and if you can't really apply them now to bring customer value, it's just a waste. It's just a waste. No one needs that, and no one is going to pay for that. So what, do you really use all this stuff you have mentioned? No, I'm, I don't use it. Why? Because Milton doesn't let me. Okay, so what Milton actually suggests you to use instead? Well, he suggests me to use something that's called HHDD. This is something that every person in our company is doing. So what the heck is HHDD? Oh, it's a very famous methodology that, that we use in our company. It's called Huyak Huyak Driven Development. Very famous one. So just get shit done, right? Huyak Huyak Driven Development. Man. Man, just slow down, just slow down. What are we talking about? You know, Johnny, there's one very interesting thing about all these engineering practices, let's say TDD or BDD, DDD, whatever. They are completely personal. It's up to you whether to use them or not. Because if you believe that these practices will make you more efficient, more uh, effective, faster, whatever, just do it because your job is actually to delight your customer. If that, this is something that makes you faster, just do it. It's not about saying, hey guys, Ken Beck wrote a book, let's do TDD. Who cares? The natural course of selling practices is starting from yourself and then people come to you, hey, you're, you're doing a great job, you're so fast. What do you use, how do you do it? I use TDD. So this should be vice versa, the opposite course. So, uh, I will give you the cliche example. If you, for some reason, need to have a surgery, you go to a surgeon and say, hey surgeon, please use these tools and processes to make a surgery. You never do this. This is insane. This is just something that doesn't really work, right? And why? Why? Even if you are a CTO of surgeons, even if you work in the healthcare industry, you never tell, you never tell surgeon how to do the job, surgery. Why? Why? Because you are not surgeon. Obviously, you are not surgeon, right? And you trust them because they know how to do their job. And I have found fantastic picture online. I usually want to slap this, uh, people's heads with this. To avoid injury, don't tell me how to do my job. Because I'm professional, I'm paid for knowing what I actually do and how to deliver nice stuff. So the message is very simple. You actually do not need anyone's permission to be professional. You don't need to ask anyone, it's completely up to you. And I will give you a short story. Uh, last year I went to the United Kingdom to work on uh, some sh very shitty consultancy project. Messy code, uh, firefighting, unhappy people, everything was broken there. So I have joined the company and I, I'm entering the building and I see the room full of people. And this is called the war room. The war room. I entered the room and the temperature was much higher in that room because people are actually firefighting a lot and they're struggling working with some stuff. So starting from day one, I decided to help the delivery team to get things done and see what the problem is. So, and I realized that the problem is that these guys are actually firefighting, obviously under pressure. They're deliver delivering a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff completely abandoned engineering practice, no test, nothing, just to hit the deadline. But a lot of stuff comes back. There's so much reward circulating in the system. But it feels that things are going fast, right? Because you still have this done column po like a, with, a, with a things that are done, right? So I started doing pair programming, working with, uh, with people, and uh, we, we start to concentrate on doing, on, on completing at least one item, but we wanted to make sure that it never comes back. Just complete at least something that will never come back. Next day, like in a few days, we sit in the room, and the guy opens the door with this like And that was the engineering manager. 
and he, he, he says, Edward, actually you are wasting our time. Since you have joined the company, people started delivering slower than before. So stop doing it immediately, he tells me, and just leave. I say, what? So I'm feeling this internal stress. I don't really know how to respond to that. So I'm, I'm sitting silently. Don't know, how, how, how should I really respond? So I woke up and said, you know, tell me how to do my job better. Just tell me how to do my job better. Uh, should I really? I say, yes, you should. You just told me that I don't get how to get how to do things. Show me how to do it better. Oh, let's have a private discussion. So we, we left the room and I told him, hey, let's do it this way. Let's pick some items from a Trello and work on them at the same time and see who is doing better. S as simple like this. He said, sure, and he was the ex-developer sort of the writing code, so, and imagine this situation in the company, the war, consultant versus engineering manager, the war in the company, the blood, the show, the cinema, right? So it was, so we took the day off and uh, that was like a, a, a very expected, a, expected, uh, ex like an uh, anticipated thing. And so we sat together, we, uh, we picked some items and we started programming. And I was actually ready to lose. I was ready to lose because the, the, co the code base was not familiar to me at all. So okay, I'm sitting writing some tests, like doing some massaging the code with refactoring, just thinking during the way, enjoying doing some meditation, you know, so like to, to, to concentrate, writing code, writing code, and these guys writing something, writing something. And in the four hours, I get working stuff, Push to the main line, well tested, so ready to ship. And I'm looking at this monitor. How are you doing? And he's looking at me with the red eyes because his code it doesn't compile. It's red. It's like a shotgun refactoring without any discipline. Just a mess. Nothing was there. So everything was there, but nothing was there. So and I told him, you know, man, if you can't really prove me how to do my job better. Never tell me how to do my job. And that was the end of the story. So I want to give you a very small hint. Every day, every time, there will be someone in your company, in your team, with an extremely dogmatic view on how to do something. Very opinionated person who says you have to do this or you don't have to do this. You have a tool in your toolbox. Wake up and tell. Prove me, show me how to do it differently. And at this point, most conversations actually stop. Prove me, be ready to challenge people back. Challenge people, hey, can you really prove me? If yes, fantastic, it's a win-win for everyone. But usually people just can't. Okay, what if you have some idea, let's say you work in a product organization, you have an idea that goes against everyone's beliefs. Let's say the management, product owner, whatever. Here's a backlog of items and you have nice idea to create but no one has a time for it. What should you do? So for me the answer is quite obvious. Your job again is not to delight your product owner. Your job is not to delight your manager but your job is to delight your customer. So, and I want to give you a very small picture. The, the, this, is a, this is actually how most companies work. So there are money in the cloud, especially when you're a developer. Money comes from cloud, right? So there are, there, there's, there are money and there are customers, customers who pay you money, a lot of money, or they do, don't pay you, for example. That's a problem. So money goes from up down, so customers pay you money, there's a top management usually that decides so how to sort of use the money properly, reinvest money or create an IT budget together with Milton, right? And then from this IT budget, Milton takes the salary. You know, Johnny, here's your small tiny piece of deserved money. That's how it is, most of the time, everyone agrees. So. And I have a message for you. The question, actually. Who is stronger than Milton? Who is stronger than Milton? Tell me. 
Money, yes, Milton doesn't have money. Customers have money. Customers are stronger than top management. Customers is the ultimate decision power. So if customers say that something is this way, even, the, even though they are not right, they are right. Because they own this money. So, we usually concentrate on pumping money from inside the company. Give me a salary, give me some bonuses. We also we always pump from the inside. Maybe we can change our mindset or at least concentrate on adding money from the outside. How to add money from the outside instead of pumping it from the inside every day, every day. Because if you don't understand how your company makes money, if you don't understand how your company makes money, it costs you a lot every day because you don't know how to contribute a lot as well. So you're pumping money from the inside all the time. And um, the practical takeaway from this would be letting customer judge. So the customer is the ultimate decision-making power, which means that Customer judges what's important, what's not, when it's important, and when something should be done or shouldn't. So you have to make your reasoning public. You have to make sure that your ideas are actually visible. And I want to give you just a few hints. If you go directly to a customer and say, hey customer, our rivals, competitors are doing things this way. What if we, nothing bad, but you might, Give, give a huge co contribution, or you go to the customer, hey, I have a great idea, what if we try to do this? Nothing bad, fantastic. Or there's a better idea. Hey customer, look what I have just built. Because in this room, I believe that most people are developers and you are the people who actually can build something. Don't wait for someone to come up with the idea. If you have idea now, just fork the code base, go to your customer, show the stuff. Maybe it will bring money to your company. Maybe not, I don't know, but maybe it will. And we're not doing it enough. Have you heard about opportunity cost? Who have heard about opportunity cost? Okay, so the opportunity cost is actually the invisible amount of money <laughs> that your company pays every day for not having something built that it could have. So basically, if you have your ideas now in your head that are not visible to the customer, to the company, you are actually wasting the company's money. You cost your company some money because you're just keeping your stuff in your head because your company could make a lot of money now, but it's still in your head. So this is a problem. Spread your ideas among the people and customers. But it's not that easy. It's not that easy because if you go to the customer and say, hey, TDD, SchmiDD, Unikernels, whatever, Docker, people say, what are you talking about? And when I started doing individual, con individual consulting, I realized that we have to speak customer language, and it's not that easy. So I was fired, I was fired from the company that I have built, and when I started doing consulting, I was offering my customers high-quality software. So I went to the, to the customer and said, hey, I can help your developers, I can help the team learn how to do well-crafted software. And they said, okay, Eddie, we know. Thank you, have a nice day. Have a nice day. And I realized that there's a problem with me. Like a five customers, 10 customers say no. And I realized that I have to really adjust my language. So what I do now, I go to the customer side, I say, hello customer, how are you? Oh, we work this fantastic, very important strategical project. And I say, ah, you don't want to fail. You don't want to fail, right? Yeah, we don't want to fail. And then they start to listen. Okay, huh. So this is long-term strategical project, right? So yes, this is strategical project. So you want to increase returns of investment, right? Oh yeah, we do, and then the list more carefully. So you probably want to increase the lifespan of your project, right? Oh yes, we do. So I'll help your developers to work on a high-quality software. The same stuff. And they're, okay, fine. So would you just change the language, you just adapt the language, you sell the same thing, but you speak the right language, okay? So, and don't be jerk. 
Uh, because if you go to your customer or someone like <laughs> to and say, "Hey, I, I have a lot of ideas that no one else has," is this, this, this is a political suicide to your project? And because let's say I have I, I run small software house, so I'm both developer and uh, entrepreneur. So I would never build my enterprise on top of rotten foundation. If if I see that team members don't trust each other. If there are some political games, I would never do it. I would never let this team work on something that is important for me. So don't be jerk. Because if you finger, if you point the finger to someone the same finger pointing on you, how many fingers are staring back at you? Always free. So this is the worst possible strategy that you can ever apply, finger pointing. So join and follow the advice. And very quickly, QA manager and the team said, the, spread the word uh, among people that, hey, Johnny is a great guy. Johnny is actually, when, when Johnny says something is done, it's actually done. It's done. When we ask Johnny to introduce some minor code changes, he changes things and he doesn't break anything around. So he's a great guy. Customers say that they want Johnny to work on a one billion unicorn, uh, unicorn project as well. And top management invites Milton for a discussion. Milton, is Johnny happy? Is Johnny happy? So by doing things that Johnny thought is right, is important, he became VIP. The exception to the rule, so he sort of get this protection against the bullshit that happens in the company. Because companies, like a, the business people are extremely smart. And they never want to lose someone who either brings money to the company, right? If you earn company money, you have protection. Or will bring money potentially someday, you have protection. Or has a good relationship with the customers. You get protection against bullshit. And I call it CBI, Corporate Bullshit Immunity. So. The more you add from the outside, the higher is your CBI. The more you take from the inside, the lower is your CBI. So when shit will hit the fan in your company, the people with a lower CBI get, the mo uh, get more attention from management, right? That's how it is. Milton is forced to invite Johnny for a discussion. You know, Johnny, things have changed in the company. Here's your 50% salary rise. Johnny said, yeah, fine, I'm accepting the, this offer, but you have just said that there is no budget. Oh, leave this budget limitations to the rest of the team. And Johnny wakes up and says, no, Milton, not this time. I'm accepting your offer, I'm getting the salary, but go and buy everyone new MacBook Pro. Okay? So together with his team, Johnny celebrates new laptops by smashing old workstation with the baseball bats, right? Success, end of story. Johnny is successful, career is nice, life's good, right? No, of course no. Johnny goes to his girlfriend, Kerry. Kerry works as a QA engineer at a company called Vtaraklasniki. Vtaraklasniki, this is a huge social network. And uh, he tells Kerry, hey Kerry, tomorrow I'll ask Milton to make me senior full stack Scala developer. Yeah, you can. You, I believe in you. You can do it. You can do it. So Johnny goes to Milton, and what he hears? Yes, Johnny, you're a great guy. Fantastic. Everything's okay with you. But something is wrong. During the annual performance review, you got the lowest results among your peers. The worst results. So how it's possible? The best guy, the top guy, was the worst feedback from peers. Upset, Johnny 
drives back home to girlfriend Katty. Katty says, ah, Johnny, you're a loser. Take your belongings and leave. I, al I, I always knew that you will never be a senior full stack Scala developer. <laughs> Just leave, you're the loser. So Johnny goes to Lawrence again. <laughs> Lawrence, life sucks. I'm still a Java developer, I'm not a full stack senior Scala developer. So Milton doesn't understand something. No, Johnny, there's something that you don't understand. Success is a bitch. What? Yeah. The more successful you become, the more people will think you are jerk and mushroom. Because people are jealous, envy. And the question is, can we somehow turn people's egocentric nature to help us achieving our goals? Can we? I believe we can. And the first question that we have to ask, why people around should vote for us? You have been following, probably you have followed this Trump election, right, American election, so that's the same actually. Why people should vote for you? Why should they support you? What is in for them in your success? You're just a successful guy alone, right? You say, you can't win a war with a one-man army. You need a fan club. You need someone to support you. And uh, I have a question to you quickly. Did Johnny do something during this story that made others interested in supporting him? Did he do something? Laptops, MacBooks, exactly, MacBooks. He could just take the money and leave. Thank you, bye. Huh? No. Here are the laptops. And then maybe people are more interested in making you top guy, right? Because they get something from it. So my, my message is very simple. You succeed faster by helping people around succeed. This is very important. So instead of focusing on yourself, how cool you are, you focus on others, and then others start focusing on you because you focus on others. They are successful because of you and they focus on you. They want to be you more successful. Just think about it. Have you, do you know how Google PageRank works? Pa PageRank, the algorithm. Do you know? Nobody, nobody knows. <laughs> this is nice. Nobody knows. Exact, nobody knows exactly. So Google PageRank works very simple. So if you want to rate highly, like in the Google results, you need the back references. You need websites to refer to your website. The more references you have, the higher is your page rank. This is a simplified version, but anyway, the more references you have, the higher is your page rank. Think about it. And as websites that refer to you grow in authority, the authority automatically propagates to you. Now think about it. In Google, if you have fantastic content, the best content, the best website, whatever, if no one is referring to you, the only thing you have, you have fantastic content, but zero page rank. Page rank. So page rank algorithm works the same way as your career development. So references matter, not, usually not your, actually. So, some skills, of course, but the references that will play the vital role in your career. So page rank. So the message is very simple. You have to help your peer achieve their career aspirations. And I have a question to you. Does anyone in, in this room know what people in your team want to achieve, whom they want to become? What are their career aspirations? Who they are, what they want? The, the person that sits next to you doing programming, do you know? Who, who, who knows exactly? One, two, three, only a few people. Do you know what your management wants to achieve? What are their goals? Because if you become rich, right? No, that's not the case usually. This is. And this is like bad, really, because if you don't know what they want, how we can help? How we can help? You can't. So I suggest you 
when you come back to work tomorrow, no, on Monday, uh, hopefully not tomorrow, right? <laughs> so look around, look around, see these people around you and think what they want to achieve or maybe have a conversation really where the next to refrigerator and help them achieve what they want because of page rank. Practically, it means mentorship. But the question is, there are, let's say, five people in your team, seniors, juniors, mid-devs, everyone is there. Whom sh you should mentor? Who is your target audience for mentorship? Who is your target audience? Everyone? No. You, can't, you, you have to focus. You have to find someone to invest your time. Who, who will be that, that, that person? Junior dev. You know why? Because junior is a raw material. You can shape whatever you want from juniors. This is one reason. And another reason is in IT world, everyone grows so fast. The junior that now struggling with writing if conditions in Java, in five years will become your manager or will become your customer. And that's what happened in my life, actually. I didn't know when I was working with, uh, with the junior people that they will become my customers. And now, thanks God, I have a broad network on people who actually, <laughs> yeah, who are my customers and that's how I live. So this is nice. It feels like you have to focus on your tasks now because it's like a, the immediate results that you get, immediate feedback. But you have to invest in juniors because it pays dividends. Not now, but in future. Think about it. Few more hints. When you succeed, it's team success. When you fail, it's your failure. And here's the point. When you have a nice idea, great idea, oh, I know how to solve all the business problems, don't tell people that it's your idea. Tell that it's Tom's idea, it's Averan's idea, it's, it's, it's Andrew's idea, it's Tim's idea. Why? Because everyone knows that it's your idea anyway. You have the credit. Get another one by behaving as a leader. Tell that team's idea or someone's idea because everyone knows by default one credit and now you're pricing anyone else. It's two credits together. But if, you, if your team failed, if your team failed and it's not your failure, wake up and say, hey, I have failed. I have failed. And next time I will fail differently. <laughs> All my failures will be unique because I learned from my failures, and that's it. That's not someone's fault, that's my fault, and that's how leaders behave, usually. So, uh, management invites uh, Johnny for a conversation. Johnny, you scaled your success. Now your team is the best in the company. Customers are happy. I want you to make more teams like that. Sin today, your chief software architect, the top guy in the company. <gasps> Chief software architect, really? <laughs> Johnny, I always knew that you can do it. Of course, Johnny, this is so sexy. Chief software architect. Success? End of the story? Of course, no. Not that easy. Just a little bit. Johnny spent about two years as chief software architect spending his time on the paperwork, pre-sales, negotiations, managerial stuff, and he forgot who he is. He completely forgot that he's a software developer, and he forgot what his craft is. And he was sent to a customer interview to get the new, to get new customer on board, and uh, during the interview, he failed drastically. The developer from that company kicked his butt by asking simple questions. Johnny, how would you build this simple microservice? Oh, I will take WebSphere, EGB, Oracle, e and ESB, and all this stuff to build this. Another bullshit, right? So, and he failed. Chief of Trucks, the most senior guy in the team, goes to regular interview and fails. Fails. And I have something to tell you. It doesn't really matter how senior you are in the company because it's a local measure. 
It's just a local measure. It doesn't really matter. I interview many senior people every day. They are CTOs in a startup, CTOs there, CIOs there. And uh, they have this false sense of confidence, actually. They can't really answer the simplest possible questions. And that might, that might, be, that might sound funny, but you, one day you can find yourself completely aboard. And there is no way back because companies are paying you money because they want you to stay in the loop. They want you to be part of the company, so that's why they promote you usually. You are a Java developer, then you're a senior. You have this local feeling of success. You feel this energy, yes, I'm successful. And then you're a senior, then you're an architect, and you're still in the loop. They don't want you to leave. And since I spent some time in, in London, I can tell you that the shittier, the, shittier, the shittier technology they have, the more they will pay you because they want you to stay in the loop. So never let any company drive your career. Never let any company drive your career because you, you can get lost and there's no way back. So you have to validate your seniority against the rest of the industry. And what I do practically, I attend job interviews. Every quarter I have a task in my Trello board, in my Kanban board that tells, Eric, go and attend some job interview. I, in, I've been everywhere, like a Google, ThoughtWorks, whatever, every, every nice company. And I never told them that I don't need this job. No one knows about it, only you. <laughs> so why I do this? Because I want to understand where I am on the global market. How well I do, right? So you can also do some free consulting actually, for free, just for free to understand how good you are, just to enter some company to see what's there and how good you are. So there are many hints, but you have to give it a try, definitely. There is nothing bad at attending job interviews. This, you, are, you are attending job interviews not because you want to leave, but because you want to improve yourself and your company, actually. So what is the measure of seniority then? So who is senior, who is not? That's the question. For me personally, the only measure of seniority is your freedom. Freedom, is that freedom? What's, it, what's the connection? Oh, there is. Freedom to decide what to do, when to do, for what money, and whether to do something at all. Because everything else is actually secondary. So stop chasing for titles, all this like a local stuff, because it doesn't mean anything to you, anything. You know why? Because freedom is something that lets you choose whatever title you want. Chief happiness officer, whatever. So I don't know where John is now. I have no idea, I haven't heard from him for a while, but I, I, I'm quite sure that after this long journey, Johnny is in a good shape. So, my friends, I wish you a nice journey, uh, and uh, that's all I have for you for today. So thank you.